Well, if everything goes according to plan, this is our second to last sermon in the opening 12 verses of 1 Peter. I'm going to read verses 1 through 9 this morning. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit and for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the, the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading of his word. Well, last week I began the sermon with a circle. I asked you to draw an imaginary circle around verses 1 through 5. And then by the end of the sermon, we expanded it slightly to include verse 6. And my intention there was to sort of provide a, a thumbnail of the Christian life, which includes all these wonderful blessings and the reality, the present reality of various trials that grieve us. The point was, and I'm going to say it for the 637th time, that everything in that life is eschatological. Everything in the Christian life is eschatological. Indeed, the whole Bible from start to finish, is an eschatological book. That is, from the pre-fall creation forward. Not from the fall forward. From the pre-fall creation forward, it is an eschatological book. God had a purpose in the beginning, and his purpose was a glorified humanity. Adam's sin may have required a different route to that same end, but I want to stress human glorification is not an exclusively, rede a re exclusively a redemptive category. It is a creational category that has now been, if you will, adapted to the redemptive plan. So that was the circle. This time, this morning, I am starting with a rectangle. Next week, it'll be a triangle. 
No, we won't do a triangle. But if you don't like rectangles, you can use a square. Choose your parallelogram. And I'm thinking of the one that is on Voss's chart, which is hanging in the library. If you haven't seen it, you need to go and, not now, but go and look at it, contemplate it. Next week, we're installing kneelers in front of it with votive candles. And we'll turn the lights down and look at it that way. That chart is very simple. And it comes from Voss's The Pauline Eschatology, which, if you haven't read it, let me heartily recommend that book. But it's the Pauline eschatology. But our Peter here, he also has an eschatology. And though I'm convinced, of course, that he shares it with Paul, Peter's eschatology is not all clogged up with all sorts of false beliefs and errors. And it is right here, plainly, in verses 1 through 12. And I'm going to call it Occam's Razor Eschatology. A rule, this is Occam's Razor, is a rule that implies that the simplest explanation of a thing is likely the best explanation of a thing. So when you read 1 Peter 1, 1 through 12, there's no room in here for raptures. There's no room in here for a seven-year tribulation period. It's just Occam's razor eschatology. It's simple. It's as simple as Voss's chart on Paul's eschatology. The Old Testament, find this in verses 10 through 12, for instance, created an expectation in Israel that certain events would accompany the end of the present evil age. At that time, God would intervene and establish what the writers called the age to come. These events, and I'm just giving you a partial list, I've listed them elsewhere, included the coming of the Messiah, who is David's son, judgment, judgment on the nations, but people forget that it was also judgment on Israel itself to purify the people. And that's a thread that appears in the ministry of John the Baptist, right? That there is a, a baptism of fire that's coming, but John isn't thinking about the nations, at least there, he's thinking about Israel itself. There would be a new temple, and there would be the resurrection of the dead. Now, I put all of these categories or, or topics, events, under the heading Kingdom of God. And so all of these events are a part of that Kingdom of God. And according to the New Testament, all the events that I just listed and more have taken place already. <gasps> Lean forward. They've taken place already? Yes. All those events have taken place. The twist in this expectation was that they took place for only one man, Jesus. And they took place only in the middle of history. That was something of a curveball. And we have a sense of that in verse 11. The prophets inquired what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. But of course, I use the word curveball loosely. It was all there in the text all along. Mm. Thus, Voss's square or rectangle. 
the age to come really did begin just as the prophets foretold. I like to say the age to come was inaugurated. That's just a fancy way of saying it got started. But the present evil age did not come to the definitive end that people anticipated. And so now, plainly there on Voss's chart, the two ages overlap. They coexist. And the biblical way of describing that is above and below. In the heavenly realm, all has been fulfilled. The age to come has already gotten underway. Uh, it doesn't seem that way here in the earthly realm. Christians then participate in both ages simultaneously. Why? Because they are united to, they are joined to Christ who has indeed entered into his glory. And that union with our chart explains the suffering then glory pattern that Peter is explaining here to his Christians. This is Occam's razor eschatology. It's a simplified eschatology. So the only event left on that so-called end of the, what is it, the end times, last days calendar is a salvation ready to be revealed. That's all that's really left, except Paul does have this sense that there's a great apostasy that signals that the uh, final days of the present evil age are upon us. So what are we waiting for? We're waiting for the revelation of Jesus Christ, as Peter says. We are waiting for the outcome of our faith. We are waiting for the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse 13. It's a simple eschatology for simple people like us. And building on Peter's use of the word now, uh, verse 6, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while. Verse 8, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe. Verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through the good news. And then chapter 2, verse 10, in the same vein, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. I'm going to use the categories of now and not yet as the essential categories for hearing Peter's message to the church. Simply the now and the not yet. And so my first point this morning is Peter's now. Peter's now, broadly speaking, is the age to come that Jesus' resurrection inaugurated. It was the beginning of the age to come. And we participate in the age to come when we are regenerated by the Holy Spirit. When we were born again, right? We have this living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, many of you who have been Christians for a while know that the doctrine of regeneration is a standard doctrine in systematic theology. It either stands alone or is closely associated with effectual calling. If those two are, are not identical, then they have a great deal of overlap. 
And thus, 1 Peter 1.3, God has caused us to be born again. But as we've seen already, the emphasis in 1 Peter 1.3 is different than what we find in our theology. The latter, and you could read Westminster Confession chapter 10, focuses on an individual believer's transformation and the place of that transformation in the order of the salvation experience. And because Christians are so accustomed to systematic theology that they may miss Peter's focus, which, as we've seen, is our transfer of realms, a movement, not simply something that's happened to us, but we have been transferred out of one realm into another because of our participation in Christ that is, in the age to come. So even regeneration or effectual call is eschatological. And the now of our Christian life is the now of our new life in the age to come, which of course is typically located in the heavenly realm, it's up there. Though if you're in New Zealand, up there is the wrong direction. You can't be saved in New Zealand, I guess. But in 1 Peter 1, 1 through 12, the major feature of the now is for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. This is tough, and we do not have to pretend. We mustn't pretend that it's not. Grief and various trials are right at home in the present evil age. But for the Christian, even grief and various trials are redeemed including, may I add, the grief and trials that we share with unbelievers. There is a common grief and trial that we share simply by virtue of being human and living in the present evil age. And as we've seen, those Grievous, various trials put faith to the test. There's an intention behind them. Perhaps Abraham's tested faith provides us with a picture of justifying faith that God tests to demonstrate that this is the kind of faith that James is writing about, as we saw earlier, a genuine article. And so, as I suggested last week, part of the now is that in local communities, these tests separate, as we used to say, the men from the boys. That is, those who have a common non-spiritual faith from those who have a genuine faith. So the trials expose a worldly type of faith that to a degree, mimics the spiritual kind, at least for a time. But as James indicates, it's not justifying faith. But even this fiery faith testing is eschatological. Everything here is eschatological. As we'll see in a moment, the tested genuineness of your faith may be found, a word itself that is often eschatological, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when? At the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
But first, a brief excursus to help me contextualize my point. That's an inside joke for the Sunday school class. I'm contextualizing my point. It's about eschatology in the United States of America. It's not the same, but related to my seventh harmful tendency, evangelical, evangelicalism's eschatology is both incomplete and it's misdirected. I shouldn't have to suggest an Occam's razor eschatology, but by doing that, I'm trying to recapture and elevate the biblical eschatology that captures the biblical story faithfully. But there is more to eschatology in the American culture than what the Bible is all about. Let's call that a lowercase e eschatology, and it's common in, really, our daily lives. In fact, I would say that human beings need an eschatology. Part of communism's attraction is that it is an eschatological philosophy, right? What does it promise? Utopia of a sort. The end or goal of Marx's way of thinking gives people what they need, a form of hope and a cause to devote themselves to. Similarly, though less precisely, America has always had its own eschatologies that go back at least to John Withrop's misapplied city on a hill message. For someone who knew as much as he did, it's a shame that he misapplied what Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount. So beginning, and I'm, I'm being intentionally brief here, beginning with the city on a hill, then on to our independence, then on to manifest destiny in the 19th century, all of these things are eschatological. And they prove to us that God is active here and doing good things. And we're a part of it. And we need that. So the idea of an eschatology, a goal to be reached, a destiny to fulfill, how things will end, and we know them ahead of time, these things run through all of American history and American culture, no doubt fueled by our religion. So in the, in the gene pool of American culture, there are strains of millenarianism and evangelicalism that have sort of influenced how other more secular areas of American life think and talk and believe. So evangelical strains in our culture's genetics are very influential. This includes our bleaker and darker eschatologies, the ever-present expectation of a great national crisis. I can't count, I don't read the articles anymore, but I can't count the number of headlines that predict a stock market crash like 1929. I think Jamie Dimon from, is he Morgan Stanley? Uh, he just had a prediction about how everything's going to go bad this year. Always read that stuff. And no one's ever held accountable for it. Or how every international war could lead to World War III. When Ukraine was invaded by Russia, could this be the beginning of World War? And I'm not talking about the, the dispensationalists. I'm talking about the popular press. Something goes on in, in the, 
the Straits of Taiwan? Could this be the beginning of World War? And then they bring in an expert who describes how World War III, like some type of cause and effect, might come from this. Iran attacks Israel. Could this be the beginning of World War III? I don't think other people automatically jump to eschatological conclusions, but we do. And you see it profoundly in our politics. It's an election year. So naturally, as you all know, this is the most important election in our lifetimes for the eighth straight presidential election. Because our democracy is at stake, don't you know? Or the Marxists will take over with all of their perverse sexual practices. Mm -hmm. Only one man stands in the way of either of those two outcomes. Listen to this from the New York Times. One of their correspondents went to a party's national convention. He described the convention as, quote, a convention of fanatics. Political speeches were interrupted by the singing of hymns and cries of amen. It was not a convention at all, he reported. It was an assemblage of religious enthusiasts. It was a Methodist camp meeting done over into political terms. The delegate sang, we will follow Jesus, but with the candidate's name replacing Jesus. The candidate told the rapturous audience, our cause is based on the eternal principles of righteousness. We stand at Armageddon and we battle for the Lord. Wow. I mean, talk about the most important election in our lifetimes. Except that convention was the Progressive Party's convention, and it took place 112 years ago. We Will Follow Roosevelt was the hymn that they sang. And does anyone here remember LBJ's famous or infamous Daisy ad? There's this sweet little freckled faced girl. You can find it on YouTube if you've never seen it. And I'm guessing she was about my age at the time. And she's out in the field and she's plucking the petals off a daisy. And she's counting. And she gets the count mixed up, you know, because she's just a little girl, freckle face, blonde, right? And as she's counting the petals, there's an overlap of a countdown that re from, you know, like a NASA kind of countdown to a hydrogen bomb explosion. And a voice comes onto the commercial, vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. The stakes are too high to stay home. So if you vote for Goldwater, you're voting for international thermonuclear war. You see, this is all eschatological. We, we, we swim in it. And because we swim in it, we don't taste it. Because it's all we know. Fallout was, was released this week on Amazon. It's about life after a nuclear war. Last year, HBO had a big hit. The Last of Us, which was about fungus that wiped out human population. There's the popular Walking Dead series. Cormac McCarthy wrote a book called The Road that was made into a movie, post-apocalyptic world. I remember seeing The Omega Man when I was a kid, Charlton Heston against the whatevers who came out only at night in a post-apocalyptic world. This is just the broader culture. I haven't said anything this morning, at least in the sermon, about the harm that dispensationalism and theonomic post-millennialism 
have done to how Christians think, let alone all of those 19th century millenarian movements that had people heading for the hills. We had a family, Y2K. They packed up everything, sold what they had, and moved to the Ozarks with guns. It's like, eh, never mind. You, you can't convince people once they have that mindset. And I'm saying all of this to return to my point that Peter's eschatology is so simple, so accessible to the most ordinary Christians. Paul likens this to a marathon race, which is a wonderful metaphor, because not only does it require effort, I'm told, but it's a distance that has to be run. And so especially in Philippians, think about the Christian life as a group of us. And I, George says he likes to run in groups when he trains for marathons. Okay. They have a long way to go. And they encourage one another along the way. But they're not competing. Everyone gets to break the tape. Well, Peter imagines the very same thing, but he imagines it as a movement toward a goal, like the exodus or like the return from exile. And it all takes place within Voss's box with its now and its not yet, with its suffering, then glory. So what I'm asking you to do is clear out your end of the world cash, whatever buttons you need to push, because it's gumming up your operating system. So cluttered by religion and culture both, so you can see Peter's now, and then you can see more clearly Peter's not yet. That's my second point. Briefly this morning, Peter's not yet. Who knows how many books have been written or how many sermons have been preached on Christian suffering. And these are, I'm referring to serious books and serious sermons on a serious subject as the Bible itself concedes in so many places. In my own experience of reading and listening, one aspect of the now suffering tends to get overlooked. Maybe other people are cover, covering it well, I just haven't seen it. And in fact, I confess that I missed it when I worked my way through 1 Peter. And it comes at the end of chapter 1, verse 7, right? In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that, this is the intention, the purpose to accomplish an end, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And here I can illustrate for you the, the human tendency to find what you're looking for in a passage. Because I read that to mean, obviously, that when we cross the finish line and when Jesus is revealed, we will offer to him what he is worthy to receive, namely praise and glory and honor. We love him now, but we haven't seen him. But when we cross the line and Jesus is revealed, we will offer him praise and glory and honor. That is, we'll worship him. But after I read on that passage, a number of writers convinced me otherwise. The object of the praise and glory and honor, which in this case is not worship, 
is our faith. That is, faith that withstood the tests. Do you see it? It's really wonderful. Inside that rectangular or square, whatever we're going to call it, we will be grieved by various trials, at least for a little while. That's not measured on the clock as much as it is in eschatological time. But even all that testing has a good ending. Because when the curtain drops, when the veil is pulled back, and Jesus Christ and all of the heavenly glory are revealed, when the heavenly and the earthly realms are united, our faith will be celebrated. Who celebrates it? I don't know. The angels? Resurrected Christians? Our Lord Jesus? Maybe all of them. And so what Peter is offering here as a way to think about the various trials that grieve us for a little while is that we anticipate, we hope for, we eagerly await the praise and glory and honor our faith will receive, even if in the world it's rejected out of hand as useless and primitive and bizarre. So we have just one more incentive to be faithful, that is to be full of genuine faith, because this is what will happen at the end. It's, it's, it's not unlike what um, Peter says about Jesus in chapter 2, verse 4. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men. That's now a matter of history. That's, that's the present evil age's verdict on the Son of God. Rejected by men, but in the sight of God, he is chosen and precious. We have just one Jesus, yet two of the most entirely opposite verdicts on the one Jesus. The world's verdict, they looked at Jesus and they regarded him as unworthy, unfit, and therefore to be rejected. God's verdict, well, Jesus was chosen and honored respected, esteemed, that is, he was precious. These verdicts are not a matter of personal opinion or common taste, because only one of them matters in the end. And tested faith that God certifies to be authentic in a people who are chosen and precious to him, that is an eschatological verdict that we can live for. Let's pray. Oh, our gracious Heavenly Father, many of us, if not all of us, but in various ways, have been or are being grieved by trials, trials that seem to weigh on our faith, trials that, when accompanied by satanic whispers, suggest that our faith is misplaced, that when we say, how long, O Lord, there is no answer to that because our faith is in an empty, mocking universe. And so, as the apostles themselves have acknowledged, these do grieve us. And it's so very difficult to see your hand in them, let alone your handiwork, let alone the ultimate purpose 
of that praise and glory, praise and glory and honor for our faith. It is only for a little while, but it can seem like an eternity to us. And so we pray that not only will you give us grace to remain firm, that's what Peter tells us at the end of his letter, but also to see behind the curtain, to see your purpose in it, the so that of those various trials that grieve us, so we can take a kind of comfort that the faith that we possess is being tested by you and for your own glorious purpose and our own glorious end. Help us to do that and help us not only to look to Jesus for help in our time of need that he might grant us grace, but to simply observe his various trials that grieved him and how he set his mind fully on the appearance in the heavenly court where he would be vindicated and declared precious. Help us to that end, we pray, even now as we turn to the Lord's Supper, a meal, a meal here delivered from the age to come and presented in the midst of the present evil age, that we may partake together as those who are exiles and aliens in the dispersion, reaffirming our identity, preserving our communion with the Lord and with one another, and of being strengthened in the very union on which we depend. Grant us these blessings and more, we pray, as we return thanks to you for your indescribable gift, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So returning to the faith that we confessed, what is happening here? How should we interpret what seems like such an ordinary and simple event, distributing thimblefuls of wine or grape juice and little bits of bread? Well, this came from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He's showing forth his death. And those of us who communicate worthily strangely, mysteriously, are feeding upon his body and blood so that we may receive a spiritual nourishment and growth and grace. We have the, our union and communion with him confirmed. We testify and renew our thankfulness and engagement to God and our mutual love and fellowship each with the other because we're all participants in the very body that Jesus Christ is showing forth when he shows forth his death. And so pondering all of that, let's come to the Lord's table this morning so that we may be enriched, that we may be blessed, that we may be confirmed in a faith that does undergo various trials that genuinely grieve us but the one who shows forth himself shows forth his death. That's a trial and it grieved him as did all the preliminary torture and suffering that he endured in order to bring this to pass. If you are not a Christian this morning, then this meal is not for you. You're welcome to be here within the congregation, but the meal belongs to those who are prepared to worthily communicate. And so we're asking you not to participate in the supper, but to all the rest of you, come and receive with thanksgiving the gift of our risen Lord Jesus Christ to his church. <clears throat>